It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold. Peace on the earth, good will to men from heaven. Welcome to the third day of Craftlet our 12-day Christmas story extravaganza. In solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Today, on our third day of Craftlet, I bring you two really unique stories. The first one, at first you'll think, why are we playing this for Christmas? It's because it leads us out of the Thanksgiving holiday and into our Christmas holiday season. The first one is called Turkeys Turning the Tables. The second is called Christmas Every Day. Both stories were written by someone named William Dean Howells, who might sound familiar to you because he is one of the people who helped make The Atlantic Monthly. In 1866, he was brought on as an assistant editor and he made lead editor by the time, let's say it was five years after that, so 1871. He had a really interesting career arc. He wrote all sorts of things from a biography of Lincoln's presidential campaign all the way through to the kinds of stories that you're going to hear today, which are funny and also, I think, a pretty good representation of American realism. He didn't have a whole lot of patience with the capital R romantics and fancy schmancy stuff like that. But he also, along with realism... Not surprisingly, one of the things that mattered a lot to him were social issues. Now, that might make you think that he's going to be very moralistic and dry in his storytelling. And that would be wrong. Because one of the things that makes William Dean Howells so much fun is that, yes, there are morals. And yes, he is, in fact, fighting on the side of the poor and the misunderstood and the downtrodden. But he also has a sense of humor. And... You'll see it very clearly at the end of Turkey's Turning the Tables. One of the things that I like best about these two stories is the way that he writes the storyteller, who is the papa, and who sounds like he must be quite a bit like William Dean House himself, and his daughter. Now, if you go on to Gutenberg and you find Christmas Every Day and Other Stories, By William Dean House, you'll see that there are five stories. They all have something tangentially to do with Christmas. I've just picked the best two for you today. But in some of the stories, there is a little girl and a little boy who are talking to their papa. For our stories, it's just going to be the little girl. The way he characterizes this little girl is hysterical. I have been playing the opening of Christmas Every Day for everybody who will stand still long enough to listen. And within very few minutes, their eyes get big and they say, did she really say that? Because the kid is quite modern, both in the way that she communicates with her father and in some of the things that she says. It's just a lot of fun. So my kids and I have been working on the karaoke version of the 12 Days of Craft Lit song, which is more complicated than I thought it would be to put together. But on the first day of Craft Lit, a listener gave to me some lightning in an old chestnut tree. On the second day of Craft Lit, A listener gave to me Two Cities Tales and Some Lightning in an Old Chestnut Tree. On the third day of Craftlet, a listener gave to me Three Boated Men. And in honor of Three Men in a Boat, to say nothing of the dog, today's stories are fun. I hope you enjoy listening to Turkeys Turning the Tables and Christmas Every Day. Here we go. Christmas Every Day and Other Stories Told for Children by William Dean Howells Story 2. Turkeys Turning the Tables Well, you see, the papa began on Christmas morning, when the little girl had snuggled in his lap into just the right shape for listening. It was the night after Thanksgiving, and you know how everybody feels the night after Thanksgiving. "'Yes, but you needn't begin that way, Papa,' said the little girl. "'I'm not going to have any moral to it this time.' 
No, indeed. But it can be a true story, can't it?" "I don't know," said the little girl. "I like made up ones." "Well, this is going to be a true one, anyway, and it's no use talking." All the relations in the neighborhood had come to dinner, and then gone back to their own houses, but some of the relations had come from a distance, and these had to stay all night at the grandfather's. But whether they went or whether they stayed, they all told the grandmother that they did believe it was the best Thanksgiving dinner they had ever eaten in their born days. They had had cranberry sauce, and they had mashed potato, and they had mince pie and pan dowdy, and they'd had celery, and they'd had Hubbard squash, and they'd had tea and coffee, both, and they'd had apple dumpling with hard sauce, and they'd had hot biscuit and sweet pickle and mangoes and frosted cake and nuts and cauliflower. Oh, don't mix them all up so, pleaded the little girl. It's perfectly confusing. I can't hardly tell what they had now. Well, they mixed them up just in the same way, and I suppose that's one of the reasons why it happened. Whenever a child wanted to go back from dumpling and frosted cake, to mashed potato and Hubbard squash, they were old-fashioned kind of people. And they had everything on the table at once, because the grandmother and the aunties cooked it, and they couldn't keep jumping up all the time to change the plates. And its mother said it shouldn't, its grandmother said indeed it should, then and helped it herself, and the child's father would say, well, he guessed he would go back, too, for a change, and the child's mother would say she should think he would be ashamed, and then they would all get to going back, till everything was perfectly higgledy-piggledy. Oh, shouldn't you like to have been there, Papa? sighed the little girl. You mustn't interrupt. Now, where was I? Higgledy-piggledy. Oh, yes. Well, but the greatest thing of all was the turkey that they had. It was a gobbler. I tell you that it was nearly as big as a giraffe. Papa! It took the premium at the county fair, and when it was dressed it weighed fifteen pounds. Well, maybe twenty. And it was so heavy that the grandmothers and the aunties couldn't put it on the table and they had to get one of the papas to do it. You ought to have heard the hurrahing when the children saw him coming in from the kitchen with it. It seemed as if they couldn't hardly talk of anything but that turkey the whole dinner time. The grandfather hated to carve, and so one of the papas did it, and whenever he gave anybody a piece the grandfather would tell some new story about the turkey, till pretty soon the aunties got to saying, now, father, stop. And one of them said it made it seem as if the gobbler was walking about on the table to hear so much about him, and it took her appetite all away. And that made the papas begin to ask the grandfather more and more about the turkey. Yes, said the little girl thoughtfully, I know what papas are. Yes, they're pretty much all alike. And the mamas began to say they acted like a lot of silly boys, and what would the children think? But nothing could stop it, and all through the afternoon and evening, whenever the papas saw any of the aunties or mamas round, they would begin to ask the grandfather more particulars about the turkey. The grandfather was pretty forgetful, and he told the same things right over. Well, and so it went on till it came bedtime, and then the mamas and aunties began to laugh and whisper together, and to say they did believe they should dream about that turkey. And when the papas kissed the grandmother good night, they said, Well, they must have his mate for Christmas. And then they put their arms round the mamas and went out haw-hawing. I don't think they behaved very dignified, said the little girl. Well, you see, they were just funning, and had got going 
and it was Thanksgiving anyway. Well, in about half an hour, everybody was fast asleep and dreaming. Is it going to be a dream? asked the little girl, with some reluctance. Didn't I say it was going to be a true story? Yes. How can it be a dream, then? You said everybody was fast asleep and dreaming. Well, but I hadn't got through. Everybody except one little girl. Now, Papa. What? Don't you go and say her name was the same as mine and her eyes the same color. What an idea! This was a very good little girl and very respectful to her papa and didn't suspect him of tricks, but just believed everything he said. And she was a very pretty little girl, and had red eyes and blue cheeks and straight hair and a curly nose. Now, Papa, if you get to cutting up... Well, I won't then. Well, she was rather a delicate little girl, and whenever she overate or anything, have bad dreams. Aha! I told you it was going to be a dream. You wait till I get through. She was apt to lie awake thinking, and some of her thinks were pretty dismal. Well, that night, instead of thinking and tossing and turning and counting a thousand, it seemed to this other little girl that she began to see things as soon as she had got warm in bed, and before even. And the first thing she saw was a large, bronze-colored turkey gobbler. No, ma'am, turkey gobbler's ghost. Foo, said the little girl, rather uneasily, who ever heard of a turkey's ghost? I should like to know. Never mind that, said the papa. If it hadn't been a ghost, could the moonlight have shone through it? No, indeed. The stuffing wouldn't have let it. So you see, it must have been a ghost. It had a red pasteboard placard around its neck, with first premium printed on it, and so she knew that it was the ghost of the very turkey they had had for dinner. It was perfectly awful when it put up its tail and dropped its wings, and strutted just the way the grandfather said it used to do. It seemed to be in a wide pasture, like the back of the house, and the children had to cross it to get home, and they were all afraid of the turkey that kept gobbling at them and threatening them, because they had eaten him up. At last one of the boys, it was the other girl's brother, said he would run across and get his papa to come out and help them, and the first thing she knew the turkey was after him, gaining gaining, gaining, and all the grass was full of hen turkeys and turkey chicks running after him, and gaining, 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 and just as he was getting to the wall, he tripped and fell over a turkey pen, and all at once she was in one of the auntie's room, and the auntie was in bed, and the turkeys were walking up and down over her, and stretching out their wings and blaming her. Two of them carried a platter of chicken pie, and there was a large pumpkin jack-o'-lantern hanging to the bedpost to light the room, and it looked just like the other little girl's brother in the face, only perfectly ridiculous. Then the old gobbler, first premium, clapped his wings and said, Come on, chick children, and then they all seemed to be in her room, and she was standing in the middle of it in her nightgown, and tied round and round with ribbons, so she couldn't move hand or foot. The old gobbler, first premium, said they were going to turn the tables now, and she knew what he meant, for they had had that in the reader at school, just before vacation, and the teacher had explained it. He made a long speech, with his hat on, and kept pointing at her with one of his wings, while he told the other turkeys that it was her grandfather who had done it, and now it was their turn. He said that human beings had been eating turkeys 
ever since the discovery of America, and it was time for the turkeys to begin paying them back, if they were ever going to. He said she was pretty young, but she was as big as he was, and he had no doubt they would enjoy her. The other little girl tried to tell him that she was not to blame, and that she only took a very, very little piece. But it was right off the breast, said the gobbler, and he shed tears, so that the other little girl cried too. She didn't have much hopes, they all seemed so spiteful, especially the little turkey chicks, but she told them that she was very tender-hearted, and never hurt a single thing, and she tried to make them understand that there was a great difference between eating people and just eating turkeys. "'What difference, I should like to know?' says the old hen turkey, pretty snappishly. "'People have got souls, and turkeys haven't,' says the other little girl. "'I don't see how that makes it any better,' says the old hen turkey. "'It don't make it any better for the turkeys. If we haven't got any souls, we can't live after we've been eaten up, and you can.' The other little girl was awfully frightened to have the hen turkey take that tack. I should think she would have been, said the little girl, and she cuddled snugger into her papa's arms. What could she say? Ah, go on. Well, she didn't know what to say, that's a fact. You see, she never thought of it in that light before. All she could say was, well, um, people have got reason anyway, and turkeys have only got instinct. So there. You'd better look out, said the old hen turkey, and all the little turkey chicks got so mad they just hopped, and the oldest little he turkey that was just beginning to be a gobbler, he dropped his wings and spread his tail just like his father, and walked round the other little girl till it was perfectly frightful. I should think they would have been ashamed. Well, perhaps old first premium was a little, because he stopped them. My dear, he says to the old hen turkey, and chick chick Cladrin, you forget yourselves. You should have a little consideration. Perhaps you wouldn't behave much better yourselves if you were just going to be eaten and they all began to scream and to cry, We've been eaten, and we're nothing but turkey ghosts. There now, Papa, says the little girl, sitting up straight so as to argue better. I knew it wasn't true all along. How could turkeys have ghosts if they don't have souls? I should like to know. Oh, easily, said the Papa. Tell how, said the little girl. Now, look here, said the papa, are you telling this story, or am I? You are, said the little girl, and she cuddled down again. Go on. Well, then, don't you interrupt. Where was I? Oh, yes. Well, he couldn't do anything with them, old first premium couldn't. They acted perfectly ridiculous, and one little brat of a spiteful little chick piped out, I speak for a drumstick, Ma, and then they all began, I want a wing, Ma, and I'm going to have the wishbone, and I shall have just as much stuffing as ever I please, shan't I, Ma, till the other little girl was perfectly disgusted with them. She thought they oughtn't to say it before her anyway, but she had hardly thought this before they all screamed out, They used to say it before us! and then she didn't know what to say, because she knew how people talked before animals. I don't believe I ever did, said the little girl. Go on. Well, old first premium tried to quiet them again, and when he couldn't, he apologized to the other little girl so nicely that she began to like him. He said they didn't mean any harm by it, they were just excited, and Chickledren would be Chickledren. Yes, said the other little girl, but I think you might take some older person to begin with. It's a perfect shame 
to begin with a little girl. Begin, says old first premium. Do you think we're just beginning? Why, when do you think it is? The night after Thanksgiving? What year? 1886. They all gave a perfect screech. Why, it's Christmas Eve, 1900, and every one of your friends has been eaten up long ago, says old first premium, and he began to cry over her, and the old hen turkey and the little turkey chicks began to wipe their eyes on the backs of their wings. I don't think they were very neat, said the little girl. Well, they were kind-hearted, anyway, and they felt sorry for the other little girl, and she began to think she had made some little impression on them when she noticed the old hen turkey beginning to untie her bonnet strings, and the turkey chicks began to spread round her in a circle with the points of their wings touching, so that she couldn't get out, and they commenced dancing and singing, and after a while that little he-turkey says, Who's it? And the other little girl, she didn't know why, says, I'm it. And the first premium says, Do you promise? And the other little girl says, Yes, I promise. And she knew she was promising, if they would let her go, that people should never eat turkeys any more. And the moon began to shine brighter and brighter through the turkeys, and pretty soon it was the sun, and then it was not the turkeys, but the window curtains. It was one of those old farmhouses where they didn't have any blinds, and the other little girl— "'Woke up!' shouted the little girl. "'There now, Papa, what did I tell you? I knew it was a dream all along.' "'No, she didn't,' said the Papa, "'and it wasn't a dream.' "'What was it, then?' It was a trance. The little girl turned round and knelt on her papa's lap, so as to take him by the shoulders and give him a good shaking. That made him promise to be good pretty quick, and very well, then, says the little girl, if it wasn't a dream, you've got to prove it. But how can I prove it, says the papa? By going on with the story, says the little girl and she cuddled down again. Oh, well, that's easy enough. As soon as it was light in the room, the other little girl could see that the place was full of people, crammed and jammed, and they were all awfully excited and kept yelling, Down with the traitress! Away with the renegade! Shame on the little sneak! Till it was worse than the turkeys, ten times. She knew that they meant her, and she tried to explain that she just had to promise, and that if they had been in her place, they would have promised too. And, of course, they could do as they pleased about keeping her word, but she was going to keep it anyway, and never, never, never eat another piece of turkey, either at Thanksgiving or at Christmas. "'Very well, then,' says an old lady, who looked like her grandmother, and then began to have a crown on, and to turn into Queen Victoria, what can we have? Well, says the other little girl, you can have oyster soup. What else? And you can have cranberry sauce. What else? Uh, you can have mashed potatoes, and Hubbard squash, and celery, and turnip, and cauliflower. What else? You can have mince pie, and pandowdy, and plum pudding. And not a thing on the list, says the queen, that doesn't go with turkey. Now you see. The papa stopped. Go on, said the little girl. There isn't any more. The little girl turned round, got up on her knees, took him by the shoulders, and shook him fearfully. Now then, she said, while the papa let his head wag, after the shaking, like a Chinese mandarin's, and it was a good thing he did not let his tongue stick out. Now, will you go on? What did the people eat in place of the turkey? 
I don't know. You don't know, you awful papa. Well, then, what did the little girl eat? She? The papa freed himself and made his preparation to escape. Why, she? Oh, uh, she ate goose. Goose is tenderer than turkey, anyway, and more digestible. And there isn't so much of it, and you can't overeat yourself, and have bad dreams, cried the little girl. Trances, said the papa, and she began to chase him all around the room. End of story two. Story one, Christmas Every Day. The little girl came into her papa's study, as she always did Saturday morning before breakfast, and asked for a story. He tried to beg off that morning, for he was very busy, but she would not let him. So he began. Well, uh, once there was a little pig. She put her hand over his mouth and stopped him at the word. She said she had heard little pig stories till she was perfectly sick of them. Well, what kind of story shall I tell, then? About Christmas. It's getting to be the season. It's past Thanksgiving already. It seems to me, her papa argued, that I've told as often about Christmas as I have about little pigs. No difference. Christmas is more interesting. Well, her papa roused himself from his writing by a great effort. Well, then, I'll tell you about the little girl that wanted it Christmas every day in the year. How would you like that? First rate, said the little girl and she nestled into comfortable shape in his lap, ready for listening. Very well, then. This little pig, oh, oh, what were you pounding me for? Because you said little pig instead of little girl. Well, I should like to know what's the difference between a little pig and a little girl that wanted it Christmas every day. Papa, said the little girl warningly, if you don't go on, I'll give it to you. And at this her papa darted off like lightning, and began to tell the story as fast as he could. Well, once there was a little girl who liked Christmas so much that she wanted it to be Christmas every day in the year. And as soon as Thanksgiving was over, she began to send postal cards to the old Christmas fairy to ask if she mightn't have it. But the old fairy never answered any of the postals, and after a while the little girl found out that the fairy was pretty particular, and wouldn't notice anything but letters, not even correspondence cards in envelopes, but real letters on sheets of paper and sealed outside with a monogram, or your initial anyway. So then she began to send her letters and in about three weeks, or just the day before Christmas it was, she got a letter from the fairy saying she might have it Christmas every day for a year, and then they would see about having it longer. The little girl was a good deal excited already, preparing for the old-fashioned once-a-year Christmas that was coming the next day, and perhaps the fairy's promise didn't make such an impression on her as it would have made at some other time. She just resolved to keep it to herself, and surprise everybody with it, as it kept coming true, and then it slipped out of her mind altogether. She had a splendid Christmas. She went to bed early, so as to let Santa Claus have a chance at the stockings, and in the morning she was up the first of anybody, and went and felt them, and found hers all lumpy with packages of candy and oranges and grapes and pocket-books and rubber balls and all kinds of small presents, and her big brothers with nothing but the tongs in them, and her young lady sisters with a new silk umbrella and her papas and mammas with potatoes and pieces of coal wrapped up in tissue paper, just as they always had every Christmas. Then she waited around till the rest of the family were up, 
and she was the first to burst into the library when the doors were opened, and look at the large presents laid out on the library table, books and portfolios and boxes of stationery and breastpins and dolls and little stoves and dozens of handkerchiefs and inkstands and skates and snow shovels and photograph frames and little easels and boxes of water colors and turkish paste and nougat and candied cherries and dolls houses and waterproofs and the big christmas tree lighted and standing in a waste-basket in the middle. She had a splendid Christmas all day. She ate so much candy that she did not want any breakfast, and the whole forenoon the presents kept pouring in that the expressman had not had time to deliver the night before. And she went round giving the presents she had got for other people, and came home and ate turkey and cranberry for dinner, and plum pudding, and nuts, and raisins, and oranges, and more candy, and then went out and coasted, and came in with a stomach ache, crying. And her papa said he would see if his house was turned into that sort of fool's paradise another year. And they had a light supper, and pretty early everybody went to bed cross. Here the little girl pounded her papa in the back again. Well, what now? Did I say pigs? You made them act like pigs. Well, didn't they? No matter. You oughtn't to put it into a story. Oh, very well, then. I'll take it all out. Her father went on. The little girl slept very heavily, and she slept very late, but she was awakened at last by the other children dancing round her bed with their stockings full of presents in their hands. "'What is it?' said the little girl, and she rubbed her eyes and tried to rise up in bed. "'Christmas! Christmas! Christmas!' they all shouted, and waved their stockings. "'Nonsense! It was Christmas yesterday!' Her brothers and sisters just laughed. "'We don't know about that. It's Christmas today, anyway. You come into the library and see.' Then, all at once, it flashed on the little girl that the fairy was keeping her promise, and her year of Christmases was beginning. She was dreadfully sleepy, but she sprang up like a lark, a lark that had overeaten itself and gone to bed cross, and darted into the library. There it was again, books and portfolios and boxes of stationery and breastpins. Uh... You needn't go over it all, Papa. I guess I can remember just what was there," said the little girl. Well, and there was the Christmas tree blazing away, and the family picking out their presents, but looking pretty sleepy, and her father perfectly puzzled, and her mother ready to cry. I'm sure I don't see how I'm to dispose of all these things," said her mother and her father said it seemed to him they had had something just like it the day before, but he supposed he must have dreamed it. This struck the little girl as the best kind of a joke, and so she ate so much candy she didn't want any breakfast, and went round carrying presents, and had turkey and cranberry for dinner, and then went out and coasted, and came in with a, Papa! Well, what now? What did you promise, you forgetful thing? Oh, oh, y yes. Well, the next day it was just the same thing over again, but everybody getting crosser, and at the end of a week's time so many people had lost their tempers that you could pick up lost tempers anywhere. They perfectly strewed the ground. Even when people tried to recover their tempers, they usually got somebody else's, and it made the most dreadful mix. The little girl began to get frightened, keeping the secret all to herself. She wanted to tell her mother, but she didn't dare to, and she was ashamed to ask the fairy to take back her gift. It seemed ungrateful and ill-bred, and she thought she would try to stand it but she hardly knew how she could, for a whole year. 
So it went on and on, and it was Christmas on St. Valentine's Day, and Washington's birthday, just the same as any day, and it didn't skip even the first of April, though everything was counterfeit that day, and that was some little relief. After a while, coal and potatoes began to be awfully scarce. So many had been wrapped up in tissue paper to fool papas and mamas with. Turkeys got to be about a thousand dollars apiece. Papa? Well, what? You're beginning to fib. Well, two thousand, then. And they got to passing off almost anything for turkeys, half-grown hummingbirds and even rocks out of the Arabian nights. The real turkeys were so scarce. And cranberries? Well, they asked a diamond apiece for cranberries. All the woods and orchards were cut down for Christmas trees, and where the woods and orchards used to be, it looked just like a stubble field with the stumps. After a while, they had to make Christmas trees out of rags and stuff them with bran like old-fashioned dolls. But there were plenty of rags, because people got so poor buying presents for one another that they couldn't get any new clothes and they just wore their old ones to tatters. They got so poor that everybody had to go to the poorhouse, except the confectioners and the fancy storekeepers and the picture-book sellers and the expressmen. And they all got so rich and proud that they would hardly wait upon a person when he came to buy. It was perfectly shameful. Well, after it had gone on about three or four months, the little girl, whenever she came into the room in the morning and saw those great ugly lumpy stockings dangling at the fireplace and the disgusting presents around everywhere, used to just sit down and burst out crying. In six months she was perfectly exhausted. She couldn't even cry any more. She just lay on the lounge and rolled her eyes and panted. About the beginning of October she took to sitting down on dolls wherever she found them, French dolls or any kind. She hated the sight of them so, and by Thanksgiving she was crazy and just slammed her presents across the room. By that time people didn't carry presents around nicely any more. They flung them over the fence, or through the window, or anything, and instead of running their tongues out and taking great pains to write, For dear Papa, or Mama, or Brother, or Sister, or Susie, or Sammy, or Billy, or Bobby, or Jimmy, or Jenny, or whoever it was, and troubling to get the spelling right, and then signing their names, and Xmas, Eighteen, what? They used to write in the gift books, Take it, you horrid old thing, and then go and bang it against the front door. Nearly everybody had built barns to hold their presents, but pretty soon the barns overflowed, and then they used to let them lie out in the rain or anywhere. Sometimes the police used to come and tell them to shovel their presents off the sidewalk, or they would arrest them. I thought you said everybody had gone to the poorhouse, interrupted the little girl. They did go, at first, said her papa, but after a while the poorhouses got so full that they had to send the people back to their own houses. They tried to cry when they got back, but they couldn't make the least sound. Why couldn't they? because they had lost their voices saying, Merry Christmas, so much. Did I tell you how it was on the 4th of July? No, how was it? And the little girl nestled closer in expectation of something uncommon. Well, the night before, the boys stayed up to celebrate, as they always do, and fell asleep before twelve o'clock, as usual, expecting to be wakened by the bells and cannon. But it was nearly eight o'clock before the first boy in the United States woke up, and then he found out what the trouble was. As soon as he could get his clothes on, he ran out of the house and smashed a big 
cannon torpedo down on the pavement. But it didn't make any more noise than a damp wad of paper. And after he tried about twenty or thirty more, he began to pick them up and look at them. Every single torpedo was a big raisin. Then he just streaked it upstairs and examined his firecrackers and toy pistol and two-dollar collection of fireworks and found that they were nothing but sugar and candy painted up to look like fireworks. Before ten o'clock, every boy in the United States found out that his Fourth of July things had turned into Christmas things, and then they just sat down and cried. They were so mad. There are about twenty million boys in the United States, and so you can imagine what a noise they made. Some men got together before night with a little powder that hadn't turned into purple sugar yet, and they said they would fire off one cannon anyway. But the cannon burst into a thousand pieces, for it was nothing but rock candy, and some of the men nearly got killed. The Fourth of July orations all turned into Christmas carols, and when anybody tried to read the Declaration, instead of saying, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary, he was sure to sing, God rest ye merry gentlemen. It was perfectly awful. The little girl drew a deep sigh of satisfaction. And how was it at Thanksgiving? Her papa hesitated. Well, I'm almost afraid to tell you. I'm afraid you'll think it's wicked. Well, tell anyway, said the little girl. Well, before it came Thanksgiving, it had leaked out who had caused all these Christmases. The little girl had suffered so much that she had talked about it in her sleep, and after that hardly anybody would play with her. People just perfectly despised her, because if it had not been for her greediness it wouldn't have happened. And now, when it came Thanksgiving, and she wanted them to go to church and have squash pie and turkey and show their gratitude, they said that all the turkeys had been eaten up for her old Christmas dinners, and if she would stop the Christmases, they would see about the gratitude. Wasn't it dreadful? And the very next day the little girl began to send letters to the Christmas fairy, and then telegrams to stop it. But it didn't do any good, and then she got to calling at the fairy's house, but the girl that came to the door always said, Not at home, or engaged, or at dinner, or something like that. And so it went on till it came to the old once-a-year Christmas Eve. The little girl fell asleep, and when she woke up in the morning, she found it was all nothing but a dream, suggested the little girl. No, indeed, said her papa. It was all every bit true. Well, what did she find out then? Why, that it wasn't Christmas at last, and wasn't ever going to be any more. Now it's time for breakfast. The little girl held her papa fast around the neck. You shan't go if you're going to leave it so. Well, how do you want it left? Christmas once a year. All right, said her papa, and he went on again. Well, there was the greatest rejoicing all over the country, and it extended clear up into Canada. The people met together everywhere and kissed and cried for joy. The city carts went around and gathered up all the candy and raisins and nuts and dumped them into the river, and it made the fish perfectly sick. And the whole United States, as far out as Alaska, was one blaze of bonfires, where the children were burning up their gift books and presents of all kinds. They had the greatest time. The little girl went to thank the old fairy, because she had stopped its being Christmas, 
and she said she hoped she would keep her promise and see that Christmas never, never came again. Then the fairy frowned and asked her if she was sure she knew what she meant, and the little girl asked her why not. And the old fairy said that now she was behaving just as greedily as ever, and she'd better look out. This made the little girl think it all over carefully again, and she said she would be willing to have it Christmas about once in a thousand years. And then she said a hundred, and then she said ten, and at last she got down to one. Then the fairy said that was the good old way that had pleased people ever since Christmas began, and she was agreed. Then the little girl said, What are your shoes made of? And the fairy said, Leather. And the little girl said, Bargain's done forever, and skipped off, and hippity-hopped the whole way home. She was so glad. Now how will that do? asked the papa. First rate, said the little girl. But she hated to have the story stop, and was rather sober. However, her mamma put her head in at the door and asked her papa, Are you never coming to breakfast? What have you been telling that child? Oh, just a moral tale. The little girl caught him round the neck again. We know. Don't you tell what, papa, don't you tell what. End of story one. It is possible that you are not a huge fan of the reader that we listen to today, David Wales. I have gotten very used to his voice and his rhythm, and it's become kind of soothing to me. However, if you got frustrated or you want to listen to another version just to see, I have linked out from the show notes at craftlit.com slash third, T-H-I-R-D, dash 2017, 2017. So you can go and get a link out to an alternate version, which is read by a papa and a daughter, kind of like a play. I have also linked out to you recipes for apple dumplings with hard sauce, hard sauce, and pan dowdy. If you have never had pan dowdy before, think of a pineapple upside down cake conceptually. Now think of an apple pie, an open faced apple pie, where the pie crust winds up on top, but submerged under all the caramelized juices of the apple pie. That's what I'm talking about. One of the websites I found this recipe on said that it was a Pennsylvania Dutch thing. Yay, Pennsylvania. One more stroke in the column for Pennsylvania. I'm sure that it started before that and elsewhere, but I understand why you would want to associate it with Pennsylvania Dutch cooking. It seems kind of right. It doesn't have to be done in a cast iron skillet, but I did, and it's really good. And were you at all surprised by the list of Christmas gifts that he went over? Some of that just hasn't changed a whole lot. Although I did like, and my kids liked, the parents getting pieces of coal wrapped up in wrapping paper. <laughs> kind of a way to fake out your parents. Oh, and here's a present for you, Mom. Nuh-uh, just kidding. You get coal. I also thought it was rather marvelous the way that he made everything get so expensive. And <laughs> how the mother on the second day of Christmas just wanted to weep. Because whatever was she going to do with all of this? Both the things and the trash. I would imagine, from all of the wrapping paper. That was, of course, the first thing that came to me. I hope you enjoyed our little look into the past to see what families, at least fairly well-to-do families, did and acted like around the holidays. They're certainly a lot more jovial than I would have anticipated based on tintype pictures, where they had to be frozen in time and smiling as hard at moments like that. All right, you take care of yourselves. Have a great day third day of Christmas, and we'll have the fourth day of Craft Lit ready for you very soon. Have a good one. Bye. Touch their hearts of gold. Peace on the earth, good will to men from heaven's all gracious King. The world in
solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled, and still their heavenly music flows o'er all the weary world. Above its sad and lowly plains they bend on hovering wing, and ever o'er its fable sounds the blessed angels sing. And ye beneath life's crushing load, whose forms are bending low, who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow. Look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing. Oh, rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. For lo, the days are hastening on by prophet bards foretold, when with the ever circling years comes round the age of gold, when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling, and the whole world send back the song which now the angels sing. End of It Came Upon the Midnight Clear by Edmund H. Sears and Richard S. Willis